Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shana. So uh, if we can all try to remember back to a time before our digital cameras and our digital phones and all these different devices we can use, you might remember a time when photography for, was for special occasions. Do you remember Kodak moments? <laughs> like mom pulls out the camera because it's your birthday? <laughs> It's amazing. And we probably always wanted to capture a lot more of that, but there were limitations. There were expenses and costs and all kinds of things that, that were involved there. Um, and if you look back in the past and, and potentially you know, picked up a newspaper, you might be led to believe that we as human beings could only express ourselves in words, black and white words. But that's not the case at all. We dream in visuals. Our imagination is in like a full color spectrum. We're at our core, multidimensional, expressive, creative beings who just want to express ourselves and be seen and be heard. So fortunately, since the 1990s, we've been involved in a bit of a visual revolution with the advent of all kinds of devices. Now, this is exciting. It's expressive. It's, um, it's inexpensive. There's all kinds of things we can do now. There are downsides, too, and we're going to talk about those. So first, I want to describe a little bit about the term, what I mean by visual revolution and visual integration. Basically, it's everything you heard today, right? So everything around you now, uh, there's a sense of pervasiveness in terms of the visuals in our lives. They're in our phones, they're in our tablets, they're going to be in our shower, they're in our cars, they're airplanes everywhere. Um, I was just thinking back uh, to when Ken was talking about the shower. I actually toured a house where there were monitors built into the mirrors in the bathroom. So that is, that is not fiction at all. That's out there. Um, so all these things, the apps around them, the Twitters, the Facebooks, the Tumblrs, all of these platforms, all of this is kind of what I'm defining as part of this div digital revolution and the integration and pervasiveness in our lives. So obviously today I don't have any visuals to walk you through to show you each of these things. So it's going to be a little bit more of a broader conversation about basically an area that's being completely disrupted. And you could say that we're being disrupted, right? So there's kind of two areas for that. One is this enormous freedom and ability to express ourselves that is becoming massively mainstream. It's no longer in the hands of a few powerful people or companies. On the other hand, and first of all, that's a great thing. I just want to put that out there. I love that. As a visual creator, I think it's amazing, it's powerful, and it's great for us as individuals and brands. On the other side, our self-restraint, our self-discretion are going to be tested. And for some of us, it's going to be a really, really hard test, and there will be casualties. <laughs> so let's start off just talking about some of these fun, creative apps. Um, there are thousands out there. I'm guessing there might even be some people in the room who have created some. Um, but just to be a you know, little bit relevant and timely, I just want to concentrate on Vine for a couple of minutes. So are any of you using Vine? Yeah? Having fun with it? <laughs> No, I haven't. The actor, Adam oh, we'll, we'll talk about that after. Um, so for those of you who aren't as familiar with Vine, it's an app that was released recently by Twitter. Um, it's short form video. So you can create six seconds of video. Um, there, there's not a lot of bells and whistles to it. The most interesting component is that as you take the video, you can start and stop it. So now you have this simple tool to create stop motion video. And if you just take a little time to explore Vine, you know, you'll see a lot of crap out there. You'll see people experimenting and lots of people like starting with a full plate and then it dissolves into an empty plate and that's fun and exciting. But there's also some amazing creations you'll see on there where you're, you're just astounded that of what can happen in six seconds of stop motion video. It'll blow your mind. Um, so, you know, I decided to do a little bit of research just to see what was out there, to see if there's any brands out there. Um, and you know, there were, there's not a lot, it's still very, very new and people are still figuring it out. Um, I saw a couple mentions of like some Taco Bells and MSNBC and some brands. So I decided to check them out and for the most part what I found uh, was nothing. <laughs> they were there, uh, I think they're, they're probably lurking, right? They're observing, there were maybe a couple videos here and there, um, but for the most part it was, it was nothing to really talk about. And I, I think that's a good thing. Um, I think what's really interesting there is we're, for once, seeing some companies and brands having a little bit of self-restraint. How often have we seen companies, brands, marketers, ourselves, jump into every new tool that's out there 
without a strategy, without a plan. So to me, that was actually a, a pleasant surprise. Um, one other thing I want to mention about Vine and kind of the, the creativity, something new that we're seeing is, you know, it, with Instagram and all these other tools, uh, you know, you're kind of limited in, in some of the things you can do. And there's a new category that's popped up on Vine called how-tos. And you wouldn't think that in six seconds you could really have a how-to video, right? Well, you'll be amazed. Go to the how-tos. You'll see everything from how to create perfect pancakes, how to season a soup, how to perfect your dance moves, uh, how to create a healthy smoothie. They're, they're pretty awesome. So I think these things are really exciting and thrilling and really spurring our imagination. Um, backing up to brands for a second. You know, when we create something like a Vine, it's not put out there in a vacuum, right? Your Instagram image isn't in a vacuum. Your Vine isn't in a vacuum. None of these apps are, are solo experiences. So when I go home later, I might be going through my email, and I might come across a Charity Water email. And I'm going to see their message and whatever. And then tomorrow morning, I might be going through Instagram, because I like to do that first thing in the morning. And I might see you know, some friends and their updates and things they're doing. Then I might see an image of kids in Africa with their hands under you know, fresh, cool water from Charity Water. And then I might go on Twitter and Facebook and different apps and see some other messages from Charity Water. And my point here is that they don't control the context that I'm seeing their images in or their messages. They don't control any of that. They don't know what the context is. Um, that's, it's sort of my context, right? There's a potential here for any brand to become very convoluted, for all these disparate pieces to just feel disconnected, for them to feel like they're all over the place. And Charity Water is a great example because they've, they've kind of found this, um, this elegance that they've been able to weave through everything. And their message comes across throughout all these different contexts, clear as crystal. And I think that's something that we can take away from this, where we have all these exciting apps, all these different things we can do, and there's a lot of potential for us to just add a lot of noise, for us to kind of throw things out at the story and for it to become very unclear. And there's an opportunity to also practice self-restraint, right? There's no limitations. There's no boundaries anymore to who can create and who can publish. There's no one saying, oh, that's, that's kind of crap. That doesn't belong on the web. It's fair game. So that's kind of just one lesson I want to throw out there, that just all kinds of opportunity. Let's practice our self-restraint. So uh, talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, I kind of want to switch gears, talk about a phenomena that hit the web. I guess it's been a few years now. Um, and it's called the infographic. How many of you produce infographics for clients or work with them? A few of them. Um, so infographics are these visually rich graphics that infuse all kinds of stats and, and data points into an image so that you can kind of take a whole lot of information and consume it more easily, digest it. Um, there's something else that's interesting about an infographic, and that's that it sort of ends this, this air of, um, of authority. Right? When you see an infographic, you might not necessarily challenge the data you see in it. It comes across very strongly. It's a very powerful tool when done right. So what I want to talk about here, there's a little bit of, of danger, because infographics are memorable. They're influential, uh, they're convincing, um, but they don't necessarily have to be accurate or truthful. So something the Framework Institute wrote, I'm going to read this verbatim. Um, Framework Institute wrote, people have a hard time grasping or contextualizing numbers that are beyond their everyday use. So infographics help us with comprehension. But the underlying assumption is that that data is trustworthy. So just a, a couple examples I want to share, again, just trying to bring this back to a, a business context. Um, two examples. The first, there was a car brand. I won't name it by name. They were very interested in uh, selling their cars to stressed out millennials. They felt like uh, their navigation system would ease their life. Um, so they created this infographic and, you know, with all these points about how this navigation system would help ease the stress and lives of, of millennials. Um, but what they did was they kind of hung the whole thing on this random study that didn't even list millennials as the most stressed out group out there. So it was, very, it was a very thin example and bloggers attacked it. Bloggers really kind of looked at this and said, this is such crap. You know, this is just, it's so transparent what the brands are doing here. It's useless not something that you want said about your brand. 
even worse to me, this is very interesting uh, or, or more scary for a brand. Uh, there was an infographic put out, I think a couple years ago. Um, it was the, the best selling books of all time and I think it was by a publisher. And uh, you know, it wasn't a great infographic. So you know, another thing here when you have working with visuals, you want them to be good, you want them to be strong, you want them to be effective. This one wasn't particularly effective. Um, the graphics were very weak. It was really, really wordy. Uh, but here's what the web had to say. There wasn't a single true fact on that infographic. It was utterly wrong in every way. Again, just something to be very, very aware of. So again, there's no boundaries. There are tools out there where I can just, today, collect data from everything that was said. I can dump it into a tool and create an infographic in five minutes and put it out there. This is a powerful tool we as marketers, as brands, as individuals, need to think about how we're using these tools and what we're putting out there and how we're telling the story. So moving on, uh, I think Greg spit out a whole lot of numbers. I'm going to try to compete with that a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to try to paint a little bit of picture by numbers of the visual revolution. So over 300 million photos are uploaded to Facebook every day. Get your head around that number. Um, on Thanksgiving alone, I think it was around 10 million photos were shared on Instagram, an app that amassed over 30 million users within its first 18 months. Flickr is still hanging in there. I think there are around 40 or 50 million um, digital assets uploaded each month. That was before the Instagram debacle last year, where a lot of people fled to Flickr, so that number may have increased. Sites like Tumblr and Pinterest are in there with around 25 to 30 million uniques a month. So my point here isn't just that you know, social networks are popular. It's that these are sites that are fundamentally driven by creators and curators and consumers of that expressive content. Technology has made this hap happen. Technology has brought the cost down. It's made it easy, accessible to everybody. It's also changing our habits and our behaviors, right? So anyone an oversharer in here? All right, I'm going to confess. My puppy has an Instagram account, a Facebook account, a Twitter account, and maybe a Flickr account. He is such an oversharer, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm not going to name an individual brand or person, but I'm going to kind of walk you through something here. So Shana mentioned I have a, a media company called Tech Cocktail, and we like to um, share stories about entrepreneurs um, and their, what they're doing, their adventures, what they're building, their dreams, et cetera. Um, so what if today I decided, you know what, I'm going to start another site, sister site, that's called Stupid Things Entrepreneurs Do. And on this site, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to town. I'm going to pull in stories about, you know, what some dumb young entrepreneur said about their investors, how they called their users stupid, uh, how they got really, really drunk and, and went off and did something stupid. Maybe they got naked on a beach and someone... <laughs> was there with a video camera and got it. <laughs> so I'm going to put all these you know, in, a, in a site. And you know, maybe just these stories will get some tweets and some quotes made, and it'll, it'll, it'll do well. But now close your eyes and imagine that this entire site is photos and videos. It changes it, right? Like a written story about dumb things entrepreneurs do is one thing. Now you're looking at it in full color. You're listening to this really drunk entrepreneur who can't even say his name right making an idiot of himself. Maybe I know this company. Maybe I'm his investor. Maybe it's completely changing my entire notion of this guy's responsibility and what he can do with his company. So that's a real danger. That's a real consequence. That happened last week. So I just want that to kind of pinpoint for you that we are, we are becoming habituated to documenting and sharing our world, to using all these tools that make it so easy to create and express, but that there are risks to that. And we can be kind of creating and adding to this, this bigger story and to the story we want to create, or we can be risking something completely different. So I just want to leave you with three points. The first is kind of what you've heard all day today. Technology is not going to stop for anyone. This is a visual revolution train that's going to keep moving forward. I'm excited. We're going to keep developing new technologies, apps, opportunities, spur people's creativity. It's going to be exciting. On the downside, we're going to be tested. 
there's risks, there's disruption of people's reputations, of brands, there's a lot that can go wrong, right? And third, we're gonna adapt. You know, Jeff brought up a lot of points. I have to say I was pretty depressed after your talk. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I firmly believe that, you know, we are adaptive creatures. We will utilize technology to, to continue to help us. We'll create barriers, boundaries. We'll create the reminders to turn off your phone when you're getting naked on a beach sometime. Um, so we're going to be able to fix this. But I just want to leave you with these are real risks. And you need to think every time that we're just becoming habituated to our tools. What are the risks that I'm doing? And can I create real damage? Thank you. <laughs>